when you write or talk about history, you have to decide where do you begin. I always find that the interesting part is where do I start this story? Uh, Clearwater Beach used to be underwater during the ice ages. That's where I'm starting. The, the ice ages, 20, 25 million years ago. Uh, this part of Florida, as well as America, was uh, high and dry. You could walk 150 miles out into the Gulf of Mexico before you found water. Or you could walk all the way across Tampa Bay and never touch water. Um, it's one of the, ice, the Ice Ages is divided into 25 sections. And, um, but basically, the water receded, and, uh, and it, was, it didn't look like anything you see today. When I look at maps, like the weather map on TV, sometimes they'll show the soft areas around Florida. That's the drop-off point. When the fishermen go out fishing, uh, the water drops way off and can go from 15 feet, then 60, and all of a sudden it goes to 3,000 feet. And on the other side of the state, quicker than that, you go out about a mile and it drops to three, 4,000 feet. Um, so basically when the water receded, it didn't look anything like this. Then a couple million years later, the water reversed itself and rose, okay? And Florida went underwater except in the center of the state. I uh, recently went to uh, Mount Dora and um, the Bach Tower area, and they have a plaque right next to the uh, Bach Tower that says this is the highest point in Florida. And it's something like 234 feet above sea level. Well, the water came up almost to those edges. There was a rib running down Florida, and, uh, and there's a ridge running all the way into Georgia. They say it's an extension of the uh, Appalachian Mountains. Um, but basically, somewhere around Bach Tower, you, everything south of there was underwater. Everything north of there, right down the center of the state, was, was on a ridge. And it goes through Mount Dora, goes all the way up into Georgia, and then it turns and it goes along the state line to the west. So basically, uh, we have been high and dry, we have been underwater, and then it receded to basically where you are today. You've heard those examples of if life was a clock, we live in the last second. That's kind of where we are now, because this took millions and millions of years. And uh, as it receded, then life formed. I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, but basically, Indians appeared. Uh, they, they, they moved from the north and the Russia and they came down here and we had a whole bunch of Indians living in Florida. They all had different names. Uh, the ones that lived in this immediate area were named as uh, Tobagas, Tokababas. And um, other Indians lived south of the Tampa Bay area. They lived in Jacksonville and they, they couldn't even talk to each other. They all spoke different languages. Uh, and some were friendly and some weren't. They say that the Indians that lived around here were friendly. They were farmers, they uh, were fishermen, uh, they were near the coast because that's where they fished. They also dug up uh, uh, shells and ate the ingredients and they put the shells into mounds and that's why Pinellas County and other areas have mounds, uh, some of which have been leveled and turned into roads. Uh, some of them have been historically saved, but we had Indians from about the uh, turn of the century to when the Spanish came. Uh, loosely speaking, 1600. The Spanish came, they captured them, they turned them into slaves, they killed them, they gave them disease. And so your earliest settlers here were the Indians. And some people refer to them as the indigenous people. I've done a story recently that's getting ready to run about Columbus Day and they simultaneously created uh, Indigenous People Day on the same day because why are we giving all this credit to Columbus when these people discovered America long before Columbus did? Uh, but anyway, the Indians lived in this part of Tampa Bay. Uh, like I said, for, some, some estimates are 6,000 years back. They were more active though from about 100 AD, 200 AD to 1600. The Spanish arrived with uh, Ponce de Leon, 1513, and then other ones, other ones that followed him, and before you know it, we had a lot of Spanish people. Not so much living here, but traipsing around looking for gold. Um, so anyway, I mentioned uh, 1513, Ponce de Leon. Did you know that Ponce de Leon came to America twice? I found that interesting. I did do a story on him uh, uh, in uh, 2013, correspond with his arrival. But anyway, I found it amazing that he came to America twice. Uh, they, were, they were good uh, 
seven, eight years apart. Um, but he was assigned to come to America and set up a colony. On his second trip, he came right up the uh, west coast of Florida. I read one time that he came as far north as uh, Indian Rocks Beach, but um, mainly he went to Port Charlotte area and got off his boat there and some Indians came out. They looked real friendly and when they got close enough, they started shooting spears and arrows at him. And he got hit in the leg and died uh, of infection and bleed, bled to death. Uh, I find it interesting that Ponce de Leon was a governor himself. He was the governor of Puerto Rico. And uh, when he died, they put him on a boat to take him home, but he died on the boat while he was going home. And he, um, they took him to Cuba, and since he was the past governor of Puerto Rico, they moved him to Puerto Rico, where he is buried today and where they're having a hurricane today. Um, but anyway, so the Spanish's involvement with not so much Clearwater Beach, but uh, Tampa, uh, uh, Florida, began in 1513. Now, in 1528, some, a Spanish person came to Pinellas County, and that was uh, Pinello, I may be butchering this name, Panafello de Narvez. And he came in with five boats and came on land in that area known as Jungle Prada. And that's, if, you, if you don't know that area, it's Park Street in between Central Avenue and Tyrone Boulevard. There's a sign there that says this is the site. And there's, a, there's an Indian mound there. And he got off his ship and asked the Indians, where's the gold? And they said, uh, I don't know, that way. They wanted him to leave. Uh, I could talk for hours about him, but I find it interesting that uh, he was the first non-American Spanish to explore the United States because they got off their ship and they went north and they're in the heavy metal and uh, they were dying from disease and mosquitoes and alligators and he got off the ship with like 200 people and went north. He took some of the Indians as guides and they just wanted him to leave. Uh, long story short, he got over somewhere, oh it's a, it's a beautiful story, I plan to write this up. Um, they died along the way, except for five or six people that survived out of this two, three hundred. But anyway, it started in Pinellas County. Okay, they were the first ones to explore America long before there was a St. Augustine or a Jamestown. I don't know about the Norwegians, but uh, that's another story. Um, ten years later, nine years later, Hernando de Soto came to America looking for him. His wife asked him if, if uh, he could go look for my husband, but then again, they were all looking for gold. And he came into Tampa Bay looking for Panafilo. Uh, he was the second person to explore America. Now, they got a big fort and museum down in uh, Bradenton that says this is the site. And it probably wasn't. Uh, they built the museum before anybody else did. And, uh, but there are reports that he explored and went north just like uh, Navarez, uh, theoretically looking for him, but theoretically looking for gold, because they were finding gold all over other places but here. And um, he went all the way up North Carolina and over the Mississippi. And if you ever look that up, I mean, his course goes like this. He's up in uh, Kentucky and all kinds of places before he died. And uh, so anyway, the Spanish started to explore, but they're always looking for gold and they couldn't find any. So basically the next 200 years, they owned Florida, but they didn't do anything about it. And, uh, and in a short period of time there, the Spanish sold <clears throat> America, traded America to the British, who only held it for 20 years. And then in another battle, they traded it back to the Spanish. And the Spanish continued to hold it until another battle. And uh, the United States acquired Florida in 1821. So that's an important date, 1821. And if you read my other story about um, Andrew Jackson, uh, they sent Andrew Jackson down here uh, to basically throw the Spanish out. I could do two hours on that. Um, but he came down and kicked the Spanish out, put the Spanish governor in jail, and um, in six months, he basically had set up a government and said, I'm out of here, and, and sent a letter to Washington and says, I hereby retire from public life. I'm going back to my farm. Four years later, he became president of the United States. Um, but anyway, so when, a, when 
the United States took over Florida. It was a territory before it was a state, which came like 20 years later. And so people, after the America, or the United States, took over Florida, people started to move here. And in the beginning, they moved here and just, there were no fences. They just lived here and lived there. And uh, they settled in the area. Now, if you notice a map of developments, almost all the people settled on the coast. The only way to travel was by boat. We didn't have trains, airplanes, cars. Uh, pass, you had pass that were very crude, and, uh, and you had uh, boats. So you look at these cities, New Orleans, Gulfport, Clearwater, uh, New, um, Fort Myers area had a major port. It had a different name. I forgot the name of it right now. Uh, but anyway, uh, and they all traded with Cuba, not mentioning the uh, east coast of Florida. Major trade lines between Cuba, Key West, here, Gulfport, and then there was piratry, uh, pirates in that area too. But anyway, a lot of the people that moved in here and settled came by boat. Okay, Indian Rocks has a uh, uh, Captain Lowe that we talk about. He actually settled over uh, near the uh, United Meth Nona Methodist Church. He owned all that land. And, and he was a captain that went back and forth and came in through Clearwater Pass and went down that way. Other people came in here and settled in this area. Uh, and then they started to build their lives. Well, nobody owned this land. They just settled. And uh, so then the government wanted people to settle here and become producers and paid taxes and things like that. So they set up something called the uh, Armed Occupation Armed Occupation Act. There's a fourth word there somewhere. Uh, it was in 1842. Um, if you agree to stay on the land and farm it, develop it for five years, they would give you 160 acres for free. You just had to register and say, I want this land. Well, most of the people just registered the land they were already sitting on. You know, they had neighbors, they're farming, and they just basically said, I want this land that I'm already on. So they came out and they surveyed the land and said, from that post to that post, you hereby are the owner. Well, this was in 1842, and by most of these land deeds got documented a year later. They had to be carried to Gainesville and then uh, Washington, and they became a matter of record. And this wasn't just going on here. This was all over Florida. Okay, but here in uh, Pinellas County, which was later called Pinellas County, there's a good 50-60 uh, of those people who are considered our first settlers. Now that piece of paper we just handed out is a map I Xeroxed out of a, uh, somebody else's book. And I'm planning to do a story on this, to who are those people. Now you notice none of them were on Clearwater Beach. Okay, nobody lived out here. Uh, the um, um, th there's some names there I recognize. Stevens is one of them. Stevens Creek. Uh, Stevens is one of the very first purchasers of land just south of the uh, Memorial Causeway. And, uh, and he had 160 acres of basically from Cleveland Street South. And he later, we talked about this in one of my articles, cut it up in half and he sold half his land to John Taylor. John Taylor came down from Brooksville and was looking for a place to farm and Stevens uh, he sold half his land to Taylor and half the land to somebody else. And then um, Taylor wanted to move, so he sold the land to somebody else in exchange for a slave that he didn't want anymore. The slave had tried to kill John Taylor, and so he said, I'll give you the slave. <laughs> the guy, I don't know, one of the two guys, they bought the land for, in exchange for a slave that they didn't want anyway. But you can see these names, Thomas Piper, Samuel Stevenson, Rebecca Jenkins, uh, Bird and Stevens again. Stevenson and Stevens. Uh, I'm going to research these people better and do a story on that. The names in the right below that, uh, Charles McKay, George McKay, they were brothers. Uh, there's three McKays there. And they have 160 acres right next to each other. And today we have something down there on Indian Rocks Road called McKay Creek. Okay? And they had the land around that. And I mentioned earlier Captain Lowe. Captain Lowe sold his land, bought his land from them. He didn't get 160 acres. He got like 80 acres. And, and, and we know him because he was newer and well documented. His son became one of the first county commissioners and things like that. But anyway, this is a map of where the first people settled in 1842. 
10 years later, there's a lot more people in this thing buying and selling land. And I notice there's almost nothing recorded down here around St. Petersburg, which I'm looking into because there was a family down there named the Bethels. Uh, and they have a similar historical story. Uh, I see nothing here about Tarpon Springs. Doesn't mean people didn't live there. It just means they didn't register and get their land for free. Okay. Um, some of the first people to actually start settling and living on the beach happened in Paso Grill. Paso Grill was reachable from Gulfport by a series of boats, sailboats, ferry boats, used to regularly go there. And um, so some of the very first people that built a house of record and lived on the beach, not in Pinellas County, but the beach, happened in Paso Grill. Uh, I just uh, was given this book uh, this week or month. It's written by Wayne Ayers about a, a person who owned a hotel in Paso Grill. And he wrote about the history of Paso Grill and he knew everybody. It's a great book. Uh, I called him today. I said, where can people buy this? And it's Amazon. You've got to buy it on Amazon. They have it at Heritage Village and they have it at Krabby Bills, but nothing in the Clearwater Beach area. It's called Pioneer Days of Tampa Bay's Gulf Beaches. Um, it's a great book. I got mine all marked up because I'm going to do some stuff on that. But anyway, the very first settlers were in uh, Paso Grill. The next area to develop was Indian Rocks Beach. Indian Rocks Beach, it's narrow there, and somebody set up a uh, ferry service so they could push across right there at Hamlin's Landing, where we have a hotel now called Hamlin's Landing, but it was basically at that location. And this guy would take people across the, the uh, intercoastal to their house. To their, there were no bridges. Okay, there was no bridges at all, and there were no cars, so there didn't need to be bridges. But some people were buying this land, Indian Rocks had a couple of the people, Hamlin, Harry Hamlin, and uh, another guy, they bought all of Indian Rocks Beach, and they realized they couldn't get other people to live there, they couldn't sell the land unless they, people could get there. Um, let me, um, okay, uh, Tate's Island, okay, where we're standing used to be called Tate's Island. That was loosely called, it wasn't officially Tate's Island, but the guy that bought Clearwater Beach, or I should say half of it, was named uh, Ernest Tate. He came over here and he bought half of Clearwater Beach for $200. Um, he went to a hardware store and acquired some material to build a house. He didn't have any money, so he told the guy that gave, gave him a deed and signed it as worth $450. And he came over here to Clearwater Beach and built a, a house. There was another person on Clearwater Beach, I don't have the name. And um, years later, a couple years later, he had to run an errand somewhere well out, well out of this area. And um, a hurricane hit, and his wife was left here alone. She saw the waters rising. She went out and tied herself to a palm tree. And uh, the waters rose, and the, ho the water went right through the house. And when the waters receded, some friends from Dunedin came and picked her up. And she says, I'm never going back to that island. And when the husband came back, he knew that she was serious. And he went to the guy that owned the hardware store and says, the island's yours for $450. So he made a small profit in a couple of years uh, by selling the land back. And he went on to live on the mainland for many years thereafter. Uh, Clearwater Beach was not as large as it is today, okay? Uh, the developers have come in and built seawalls. The seawalls are usually built further out and then they backfill them. Um, it was probably half the size of what you see today. And you hear about hurricanes creating passes and moving things around. Imagine this land lower, because it wasn't filled, and there are no seawalls, okay? So every time you had any kind of a storm, things changed. Passes opened and closed, and I could, there are several that have come and gone. Uh, but anyway, Clearwater Beach was nearly a half of what it is today. So when he bought half of Clearwater Beach, he, had a, he bought about a quarter of it. And I believe his, his uh, purchase was uh, north of this area. I believe his uh, Tate's purchase was where the Hilton is today, which used to be a Holiday Inn and used to be something else. So basically, Tate's house was near where you see a Hilton today. Uh, another thing that occurred about that same time is... Uh, the land in between uh, the north end of Clearwater Beach and Caladesi Island. Now it's just filled in, you can walk through it. And most people have been here any period of time know that you used to take boats through there. I took a boat through there um, 30 some odd years ago. Uh, but it used to be called Big Pass. Now it's No Pass. Okay? That used to be called Big Pass. 
And that all these people that came into Clearwater with their boats, they came that pass, not this one. This was called Little Pass. And I've talked to people that said it was so narrow you could throw a softball from one side to the other. Now it's wider and deeper and that's our main pass. And now we have seawalls so trying to make that not change. <clears throat> but you have storms. Uh, the pass up here at the north end of Caladesi. It's called Hurricane Pass for a reason. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but it was created by a hurricane when there were no seawalls. Um, anyway, uh, around before 1900, about that time, we started to have the inventions of electricity, telephones, automobiles. So things started to change around the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, the first cars actually came to Pinellas County around 1905. Although they existed elsewhere, they came to Pinellas County about 1905. And with that, you had to have gas stations and roads. So it started the development. In 1905, nobody could take their car to the beach because there were no bridges. Okay, so building the bridges was a, a major step in developing Clearwater Beach. Uh, uh, Morton Plants, Morton Plant, the son of Henry Plant, was a major car collector. I mean, he was one of the richest men in America, and he loved to collect cars as well as sailboats. And uh, he would bring some of his cars here, and then that led to the building of roads, because he paid for the roads near uh, the hotel, Bellevue Biltmore, and later the rest of the, the hospital. Um, but anyway, um, so cars didn't become active until 1910-ish, okay? So which means people started talking they have a bridge like they have one in the other city or they go up north and they see them in Philadelphia and they go, why, why can't we have bridges? So they started the idea of building bridges. Now, back then, uh, governments didn't build bridges. Individuals built bridges and they put tolls on them and they collected the money from them. So the very first bridge to get built along the entire intercoastal was in Indian Rocks Beach. They built a short, stocky bridge that had a turn in the middle. And I've done many stories on that. And uh, it was a, a sturdy bridge, um, but it was the first bridge. Okay, that was opened in 1916 on Thanksgiving Day, and it was built by three people, two of which were McMullins. Okay, the McMullins built that bridge, and across the bridge there was a, a, a pavilion, sort of like this one, and uh, and so they had, you know, people realized we got to have a reason to go there, so they used to own both ends of it, and um, so that was in 1916. In 1919. They built uh, another bridge in um, the Blind Pass area of St. Pete Beach, connecting with Passa Grill. Very long bridge with a turn thing in the middle. And um, again, an individual built that bridge, a guy named McAdoo. And uh, then up here, they built a bridge that connected from Seminole Boat Ramp over to where we're standing. Okay, it basically came down here. And there was no island estates. It was a, they called it old rickety. Okay, and every time a car went by, the boards went like this, and they called it. And they could they could tell if somebody was coming. Okay, and it was quite a long bridge. Uh, I mean, it was over a mile long. And uh, <coughs> so um, then we had a hurricane, and it was a hurricane in 1921. If you've heard the uh, Billy, if you've heard uh, them talk about hurricanes. 1921 is the last time the eye of a hurricane hit Pinellas County, including now. Irma did not come through Pinellas County. It went through part of Hillsborough County. Just the fact that you get hurricane force winds doesn't mean it hit Pinellas County. So anyway, we had the hurricane of 1820, 1921, and the eye went through Tarpon Springs. So the circulation went south and filled up Tampa Bay. And um, it knocked down every single bridge in Pinellas County except the one in Indian Rocks. It knocked a little hut off the water. There was a fish hut that got caught under the bridge and they couldn't use the bridge for a week because the, the house was caught under the bridge, but it didn't knock it down. Did you know that downtown St. Pete used to have five piers? Different individuals owned the piers. There were five of them. They had to go out far enough that boats could connect with them. Knock down all five piers. Uh, in downtown St. Pete, they decided it was such a tourist attraction that the city agreed to build a new one that's called the Million Dollar Pier. And they immediately put up another pier, but immediately means it takes a couple of years. But they put money into it. And the, what, the bridge that I mentioned that we had right here, it got knocked down. So the uh, city of Clearwater immediately uh, pulled together a bond issue and said, we need a bridge. And so here the government started building bridges instead of individuals. And so they built a bridge uh, a few years later, 1926, I think. And it's more like where the, uh, 
Memorial Causeway is today or the Coachman Park, okay? So they built a low, old-fashioned bridge, 1926, and then in 1960 they decided to build a, a better bridge, and there was a lift bridge in the middle, and, uh, um, and then 2005 they built what we have today. So um, anyway, the bridges were important for getting people wanting to live here, real estate people being able to sell their properties, and um, um, I think the, uh, the coming of the bridges was an important uh, part of development here. Um, 1924, um, this island which had no name, Anne wrote something that it used to be called the Isle of, Isle of Palms, and then it was the Isle of Palmettos, and uh, uh, it's had other names. Uh, you, on, on, on maps it used to be referred to as Clearwater Key. You had three keys, you had Clearwater, you had Sand Key, and you had Long Key. You still have those. If you look at a map, you'll see Long, Sand Key is not just this small section of Clearwater Beach. Sand Key is the entire island down to Madeira Beach, which has now been incorporated in all these cities like Madeira Beach, Indian Rocks, Three Reddingtons, okay, that's all Sand Key. And this area used to be called Clearwater Key, officially. And um, so anyway, they, uh, the city gave it a new name, and in 1924, <laughs> they changed the name officially to Clearwater Beach, 1924. Uh, then you started to have developers. You got these roads, these bridges, and so people started saying, uh, I'm going to build a house, I'm going to build a road, I'm going to build a development. Um, trying to get down to, uh, there was a guy named Skinner. Uh, and this, this guy goes back to the early 1920s, and, and he was from Dunedin, and he wanted to develop this area, and he worked on the area north of what we call the, round, the roundabout, and he helped um, lay the land where Man Mandalay Boulevard sits, and some of these other roads were created, like Bay Espanyad. And um, so anyway, from about 23 to 25, people were buying land in Florida without seeing it. They were, they were changing pieces of paper before it went to the courthouse. It was amazing, and not just here, okay. I mean, St. Pete was even more than this, but they're buying land on the beach, they're buying land in Clearwater Beach, Clearwater Mainland, Tarpon Springs, and people up north are buying land without even seeing it. See it advertised and they're, they're mailing in checks. That all stopped in 1926. Uh, it went from boom to bust. And all kinds of people went bankrupt, stock markets crashed, and um, everything kind of stopped. But this has been this way forever. You have boom, ba boom, bust, boom, bust. And, uh, and it goes on into today. I mean, a couple of years ago, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, Skinner helped develop the north part of the beach. And uh, uh, he wasn't the only one. Okay, there were other people doing it too, but his name is much associated with the beach here. Uh, John Taylor came over and bought a major section of land. I mentioned earlier that he owned the land under today's Hilton, and he still does. He's dead, and so are his kids, but uh, uh, he sold one of the hotels a land lease for 99 years. And so your Holiday Inn that was there before that, was that where Jolly Roger was? There's some other hotel right there, and then the Holiday Inn, then the Hilton. They probably used up 50% of that 99-year lease, so I don't know what's going to happen <laughs> 49 years, but it'd be interesting. Uh, you know the price is going to go up. And um, the Carlewell Country Club, it's at the north end here, and uh, it's one of the first planned communities on the beach, sort of planned, and there were three developers, and if, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but there was, uh, they named Carlewell after their wives, and so it was Carol, Louise, and Ellen, I think. And uh, they put that Carlewell, Carlewell, and, uh, and so the development and then the country club got that name. And again, further north is where there used to be a pass, where there's no pass anymore. And the north end, you know, the, the, the gates there, some very rich people live beyond those gates um, today. <coughs> if you think that's bad, you should hear my wife. Um, anyway, Island Estates, I'm looking at it right over there, it used to be a big mud flat. And um, as far back in those days of the 20s, uh, the Skinners and some other people started buying land that was underwater. They bought the rights to this land, and uh, they didn't do much with it until uh, about World War II, about the 40s and the 50s, a major development right after World War II for a variety of reasons. And then they started wanting to form that into land people could live on, building the seawalls, backfilling, 
And then they had people that want, did not want them to do that, and the people that said, I don't care. And the people that said, yes, we need development, we need places to live here. So there's some trade-offs with the government. Uh, it could have been much larger, but they gave the city of Clearwater some underwater rights in exchange for letting them go ahead with their development. Uh, there was a guy named, in 1955, there was a guy named Wallace Skinner, three people, Wallace Skinner, Francis Skinner, which was the son of the other Skinner, and a contractor named Harry Amston. They got permission to dredge all that land, and uh, with the help of seawalls and backfilling, Island Estates is more like what it is today. Uh, Sand Key is an interesting story. Uh, the north part of Sand Key, nothing was being built north of the North Indian Rock city limits until after World War II. During World War II, I think most people know that Bel Air was a bombing range. Planes used to take out from a small airport in Tampa, just north of Bush Gardens, would fly this way, and they had X's on the ground, and they would practice dropping bombs. The bombs were fake bombs, um, full of uh, powder, but they'd have X's and houses and things that they were targeting, and then they would report how close they were. And uh, kids were always going up into that area looking for bombshells and stuff like that. So anytime planes were coming over from Tampa, they had to make sure there weren't any kids playing, and they regularly caught kids playing out there. The planes would fly from that side to this side, and um, there, we have a picture in Indian Rocks where one of the planes lost power and crashed on Indian Rocks Beach. And so the nose of the plane went up on Indian Rocks Beach and all the kids are playing on it and the wings, walking on the wings. A friend of mine named Billy B and his family uh, did it and have pictures of that. Uh, but anyway, Sand Key was north of Bel Air Beach. And I can't tell you how many people have told me they've been up there partying with their girlfriends and doing campfires and I am doing a story on that um, later. But anyway, um, Sand Key, going back to about 1890, 1895, a guy moved out there. I called him a squatter in one of my articles, and then somebody called me up and said he was my uncle, and he wasn't a squatter. Uh, Dan Anderson. Dan Anderson uh, homesteaded a piece of land, 160 acres, where the Marriott sits today. He was a fisherman. And he used to go out fishing. They hang their nets out to dry. So he was on the back side of the island where the Marriott is today. And he had five children. I think two were boys. And those boys later went off and started fish markets. Uh, I thought it was Ward Seafood, but I found out it wasn't. But uh, they were just north and south of each They competed with each other. They had fish market. They were in the fishing business. The, the women got married and moved out of the area. And uh, his wife hated living there. He was required because he was homesteaded just like the Occupation Act, he had to live there for five years to get a special price from the state. And um, uh, so he, he lived there, but then they built a second house on the mainland. His wife says, I ain't staying out there, there's too many bugs. And, um, and she always lived on the mainland, but he, somebody had to live there to, 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 to get the homesteaded rate for five years. Um, so he ended up living on the island by himself a lot with the kids, and they took the boys out there and they went fishing. And uh, he had a lot of hogs too. And, you know, it was sort of like, my ex-wife got one picture of a manatee one time, and everybody thought she was collecting them. Next thing you know, they're giving her gifts of manatee pictures. Uh, so he had a couple of uh, hogs, and people were constantly bringing him hogs from other locations saying, you want these, don't you? Before you know it, he had an island full of hogs. And uh, I understand San Key was covered in rattlesnakes, too. I didn't know this, but a hog can kill a rattlesnake. And um, um, so he had rattlesnakes and hogs. His wife moved off the island, and then... Uh, he died at a pretty young age, about 54, and his wife died the next year, so the kids inherited his piece of property. They couldn't pay the taxes. Enter a guy named Ed Wright. Ed Wright was a CPA, was never married, and started buying people's tax deeds. So during this period of the 30s and the 40s, like every 20 years we have a depression, uh, he's buying tax deeds all over the state of Florida, not just here, but his name's all over downtown St. Pete. Kissimmee, Palatka, and I read somewhere that he was considered one of the richest men in Florida. However, he was he lived alone, and uh, he came up this way, and he started buying tax deeds on Sand Key, including the Andersons' property, and he, uh, he built a house on Sand Key. Uh, there weren't many, but if you look at an old aerial shot, you'll see an occasional shack, and an, there used to be five or six little piers sticking off of of uh, Sand Key, and people could build what they want to back then. And there was a lot of these little piers. You have a little storm that gets knocked down. But anyway, Indian Rocks had four or five piers, and then one, and then none. Um, 
So anyway, uh, he lived in Sand Key as well as a house in downtown St. Pete. And he started negotiating with the county and the city saying, um, I'll sell you this piece of land. I, one person told me 100000 but I read it was a million. He was offering all of Sand Key for a million dollars to either the county or the city to build a park or whatever they wanted to do with it. And both of them said, we don't have that kind of money. Uh, mainly, if we buy your land, then we've got to put money into it. We've got to develop it and maintain it. We don't have that kind of money. So both of them turned him down. Turns out he went to high school with the uh, city manager of Clearwater, and they were meeting secretly to say, let's keep the deal going, let's keep talking, and we'll make this happen. And he died. He died in about 1970. He was an old man, about 85, something like that. And uh, he died. And he had no family, and he left everything to his secretary, a girl named Ruth. <coughs> that story's coming. And uh, she immediately started selling the land off. And uh, she didn't sell all of it, but she sold most of it to U.S. Steel. So U.S. Steel, who had been building condos over here at the Bellevue Biltmore and developing other things, uh, started building condos in San Key. Not all of them, but back in the 70s and the 80s and the early 90s, they built some of those earliest condos that you see today. Uh, she took the money and ran. She went to North Carolina. And um, I saw her name surface in a newspaper article where he said she, apparently he owned a like a with with a Lacucci spring or something that recently got sold and she had given that land to her grandchildren and they couldn't maintain it so they turned around and sold this was in the newspaper like less than a month ago um, but anyway San Key developed because Ed Wright died <laughs> and um, there wasn't a bridge there you know, the first bridge they built from Clearwater over to San Key was a lower one with a lift in the middle and then they built this new concrete one. Uh, the first bridge was probably built around, just after Ed Wright died, so about 1975, about the time the Sheraton got built. And, uh, and then it was falling apart, and they put money into it and have what we have today. So, um, and San Key is, I don't think there's any houses on it. San Key's like all condos. I don't know of a single house that's on San Key today. Huh? 65 houses, all right. Okay, I gotta, I gotta go, look. I can't even picture one. I guess it's on a finger. It's near the uh, Coast Guard station? Mm-hmm, yeah. Should do a story on that. Um, one more thing, uh, Caladesi, uh, Caladesi Island never developed commercially. Um, and I don't know why it's called Caladesi. Does anybody know why it's called Caladesi? Um, very interesting story. Another good book. This is available in many places. It's called Yesteryear, I Lived in Par Paradise. This is a fantastic book. And only half of it's about Caladesi. Um, the guy that moved there is, I think, from Germany, certainly Europe. And he came over on a ship and was just young and teenager saying, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm going to America. And uh, he traveled across the United States and then back through the Pan Panama Canal Zone and ended up in Tampa, helped build the uh, University of Tampa building, which was Tampa Hotel, Henry Plant. And then when it was built, he had nothing to do, so he bought a really small sailboat and sailed around the point of Pinellas and came up and discovered that land, Caladesi, and he says, I'm gonna live here. There was nobody on the island, and uh, he set up shop and squatted. Uh, somehow he homesteaded the land. And um, every time I go to Caladesi, I say, how could anybody live here? The bugs are so bad, so bad. And I, every time I go there, when we talk about it, we go, how could anybody live here? Um, anyway, he moved up here and started farming. He also raised hogs. Uh, his name was Scherer. His first name was Hans, but Hans, but they called him Henry. Last name was Shera, so people called the island uh, Shera's Island. But then when he started raising so many hogs, people said that's Hog Island. And so either one didn't, didn't matter. It's not on any maps. And uh, he met a woman because he was farming and taking stuff over to Dunedin. He met a woman. She somehow agreed to marry this guy. And uh, they went back and they had a baby. And when, when the baby was five years old, the mother died. And he, uh, <coughs> interesting story, because it's all in that book. Um, her name was Myrtle. So she went on to get married to a guy named Betts, so Myrtle Betts. That's the name that's on the book. 
anyway, she would paddle across the uh, intercoastal there from Caladesi over to Dunedin, go to school. Father sometimes would take her and they'd sell their grocery, sell their farm goods. And um, when she got to be, um, at the end of junior high school, they told her she couldn't go to school anymore. They said, why not? She says, because you're a girl. G girls don't go to high school. And uh, she was a good student. And uh, somehow they fought that. And, uh, but anyway, he, he, she lived with her father on Caladesi Island until she got married at age 21. And they went on to live in downtown St. Pete. So he was living on the island by himself. Then they had the hurricane in 1921. And uh, she had heard that somebody on the island had died. So there's no cars, or she didn't have a car. And they had to sail back. It took her a week to get back by sailboat and found out her husband, her father was fine. Somebody else had been squatting on the island and they died. And, um, but the hurricane of 1921 cut that hole between the lower half and the northern half of Hog Island. So now we have Caladesi and we have Honeymoon Island. So that entire island uh, pass was cut by a hurricane. And we call it Hurricane Pass. And um, it needs some work. <laughs> Take a boat through there, you might get stuck. Uh, and uh, like I said, so the north end became a state park called Honeymoon, and the south end is Caladesi today, uh, and it's a great place to go. And they sell these books in the bookstore. The proceeds from this book go to maintain not all of, but a number of projects uh, at Caladesi. The, I mean, it's state owned, so they have a budget for what most of what they do, but there's a lot of things they're having to do to maintain the facilities. And they're trying to build a gigantic uh, uh, tower there. There used to be an observation tower that burned down. If you walk way back through the island, there's a map to get there. His house is there. It's, it's just the framework. It was a concrete block house way back in the woods where he used to live. The book's fantastic. It's got pictures of uh, where they used to live. Anyway, uh, wrapping up, Clearwater Beach is what you see today. According to my records, there's nearly 9,000 occupied dwellings on Clearwater Beach. That includes Sand Key, I mean, Island Estates, Clearwater Beach, and Sand Key. If you add all that together, half of those things are empty during the uh, uh, snowbird season, or the opposite, the summer season. I've actually seen the, 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 the occupied dwelling numbers change from uh, 9,000 to 5,000. And most of those empty dwellings are on Sand Key. Uh, the people in Clearwater Beach here. Some of them are snowbirds, but most of them are residents that, that don't go anywhere. And San Island Estates has a few. But anyway, the population, if you take 9,000 homes and assume two and a half people live in them, it's about 20,000 people. Uh, also, you might clearly know that the, we don't produce any manufacturing here. The, the main business is tourism. And tourism goes up and down depending on oil spills, hurricanes, and uh, love bug season. Um, anyway, it also, did you know that there's uh, 50 hotels in this zip code? Now that would include a uh, vacation rental company or a small hotel, but, and you know, we've torn down a bunch of ma and pa hotels to create bigger hotels or condos, but basically, according to my records, there's about 50 accommodations for tourists uh, in this zip code. There are 90 restaurants and a whole bunch of other businesses like yours and mine that aren't even on the records. Uh, but anyway, tourism is what keeps Clearwater Beach going today.